Turn with me to Malachi chapter 4. For most of you, it'll be, uh, there might be a, a blank sheet that says the New Testament, and then just to the left of that, maybe even just opposite the page, you'll find Malachi chapter 4. Forgive me if I make some adjustments. All the movers took all my clothes, my belt, and uh, I would like to think it's because I've lost so much weight, but the truth is you guys have left me with an additional 15 pounds of pizza and pasta um, over the last couple of years, so thanks a lot. Well, something had to replace the, the Tex-Mex for us, and it was definitely Italian, without a doubt. Um, but we will go back to the land of fajitas and remember you often. Um, all right, Malachi, let's finish this up. We are finishing up not just Malachi, but the Minor Prophets today. Um, by God's grace, a, a time with you that has been a great joy um, and is very difficult to come to a close. And, and I'm grateful for his timing. We have seen this, guys, so many times where um, we've come up to a holiday season. And this is not to be overly mystical. I believe these are times and moments when the Lord coincides what's happening in the pulpit, what's happening in Sunday school classes, um, but also what's happening seasonally. Um, it, it doesn't always have to align so well, but oftentimes what I've found is that that is a gift that God gives to churches to just remind them of uh, just to remain steady, just to remain faithful. It doesn't mean you have to stubbornly go to the next text if it happens to be Christmas Eve, but you would also be foolish not to read your next supposed text, and if it happens to say something about as happened with us in Micah with Bethlehem Ephrathah, uh, kind of had to preach that one because it was just next. And it seemed fitting that the Lord would do so. We faced the same thing at Easter when we were coming up to Palm Sunday. And that was after having been away to a uh, candidate at this other church. And, you know, when we, of course, I'm looking at it in advance, but as I come back that week and I'm reminded yet again, there in the text, we have this prophecy of the, the messenger coming in on, on the foal of a donkey, literally heading into Palm Sunday. Um, and then the next week of dealing with the text of, of one who is pierced um, in Zechariah. So just incredible the, the synergy that the Lord has allowed us to experience over and over and over again. And I think that I simply trust the same thing happening today. Um, you know, we, I guess in a sense, every time any teacher gets into a pulpit or behind a podium, it could be the last time uh, there is that old phrase of we should preach as dying men to dying men um, and women. That's absolutely the case that we don't know. We have a good sense of mortality. And yet I have great hopes for you. And uh, my text today, uh, I'm not going to overly shape it to the times of where I'm at personally or where you guys are. Uh, voting today for a new search team. And yet I do trust what he has for us because I do think that as you consider that Malachi entered into the framework um, on the heels of other prophets who had seen things happen like Zechariah and Haggai had seen that the temple was to be rebuilt. But uh, in the course of that, uh, Ezra had re reinstituted uh, the preaching, the proclamation of the law in a kind of systematic kind of way. And the Levites then would provide interpretation to the households. And they began to practice some of that law, some of those practices that God covenantally had given his people because they had lost it. They had lost perspective of that. They'd been so consumed with becoming a kingdom among men that they forgot they were part of a kingdom of heaven that actually was a different standard. And that standard was, of course, God's. It had nothing to do with whether or not they were thriving or flourishing when it came to commerce or crops or anything else. Basically, we've talked about this many times, that when a people grow weary, they stop living by faith, they start to live by sight. And if you're saturated in some kind of spiritual or religious background, you're going to adapt spiritual language and practices to that very thing. And that's very dangerous. It's very dangerous, and it leads us to idolatry. Uh, that's, now, now, for the children of Israel, that's what was going on, because they actually adapted the practi adopted the practices of the very countries that had held them captive by God's will to bring them out so that he would then deliver them back to Jerusalem and establish himself as their God and they as his people. But the fact is, is that in the course of even when they went back and things were still taking too long, 
They wanted to see that a kingdom among men would be established. They wanted to see that a Messiah type figure, any number of these minor prophets, could this be the one that could assist us in becoming a powerhouse basically among men. And that's not what the Lord had for them. It's never what the Lord has had for them. He has always been about the promise that he made to Abram in, Ger- in Genesis 12, 3, that you will be the father of many nations. Okay? And he begins the Jewish people as this framework for where he would live out and show forth his covenant love for his people. But the thing is, he has always been about making for himself a kingdom from every tribe, tongue, and nation. But as he has given the law through the Jews. He's given us the word of God through the prophets to Israel. We see that what he has done, that he is saying again and again, that what is required of men cannot be met by men. Only the one who would come as a promise all the way back even to Genesis chapter 3. Only that one who would come, who would crush the neck of the evil one upon his resurrection would limit his power And would establish himself as the, not just a messenger, but God in the flesh, Jesus Christ. And in doing so, that he would establish for himself a people. Astonishing people all around him by interpreting the law as it was always meant to be interpreted. Not by an outward show as he went through the Sermon on the Mount. But to show that it's also about heart. In fact, it's essentially about heart. It's essentially about motivation. Whether or not we love God has very little to do with outward performance. It has to do with our inner motivation and affection as it reveals itself in our outer performance. And the fact is, you can't fake God. Malachi, if anything, is about worship. It's about what matters in worship. And today as we conclude, we're going to just talk about the heart of worship actually matters in all of life. Just as we saw last week, actually the last two weeks, how worship does um, feed into missions. It helps us understand that we are on mission because if a people are overwhelmed with the goodness, the greatness, the sovereign grace and love of God, they will open their mouths to all the nations. They will, see, they will seek to make sure that God is seen as great among all the surrounding nations. He says that's a natural outworking of a people who are actually worshipers of him. So as he comes to this conclusion in chapter 4, there's a bit of a, uh, a perspective here where it's just summary, but it's also summary in light of the fact that he is coming. You know, as a reminder then, you know, you had Ezra who established that law, Nehemiah who established the security and safety of the, the people, but they still weren't the nation they wanted to be. And so they began to embrace other practices. They ceased to worship God. In fact, last week we went through, last couple of weeks, we've gone through this idea that worship demands a right view of God, that he is sovereign, that he is not bound by space or time, that he is not bound by the perspectives or the understanding of men. He is God. Also a right view of God's love, that God's love is not based on merit. It's not based on ethnicity. It is based purely on the fact that God desires to be merciful to some. And even though we are blind to who those some are, we know that any of us that ever come to him by grace, through faith alone, in Christ alone, that it's God that has done the work. It's not a means, a method, a song, a methodology, an ideology. It's not a worship style. It is actually the Spirit of God that awakens men, reveals to them their sin, shows them who who the Christ was on their behalf, is on their behalf even now, and they say, Jesus, you alone can save It also speaks of with right worship must include pure offerings. The people were only bringing what was practical. Basically, they would say, hey, we're going to give you our best, but they would give them something broken. They would give unto the Lord something that was not the best. It shows their perspective of what it means for them to have a perspective of who God is. Basically, if you have a wrong view of God, you're not going to offer to him purely. It will be a matter of convenience. Also, at the core of worship is covenant faithfulness of the people. It's this charge, this admonition, this reminder that we must be faithful. We aren't going to be okay just because of who we are. It doesn't mean you can lose your salvation. It simply means that God has established himself as being a God of covenant, a God of promise. And the God of promise makes himself known to the people of that promise. And the people of that promise actually give evidence that they're his people. 
So basically, there's, there's no one saved that's not aware of that. There's no one that's going to be saved that is not able to name the name of Christ. There is no one saved that in some kind of post-mortem, after-death experience can somehow experience salvation in any kind of intermediate state or period. Those who are his are only his by professing that his promised one, the Christ, is the fulfillment of all the Old Testament was pointing to. In chapter 4, starting in verse 1, it says this, For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts. And, and that's not to be confused with like a colloquial, uh, he's lit. Um, no, this is actually pain. Uh, this is destruction, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the son of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall and you shall tread down the wicked for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and rules that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with the decree of utter destruction. And that's how Malachi finishes his sermon. I mean, there have been times that a lot of preachers have desired that the last word they utter could be destruction. Um, but uh, that's, that's not going to be the last word that I share with you. And yet, it is important for us to understand a couple of things about this dynamic that we see in chapter 4. Again, Malachi is using a language that people knew of the time. Okay? So when he's talking about covenant faithfulness, they would understand the covenant that God made with them, especially as it's managed or administered through the law that God gave to Moses at Horeb. Basically, they are called to be faithful. When he speaks of Elijah, of course, we know this to be a reference to John the Baptist as he comes, and we'll get there in just a moment. But that reference, that prophecy, as you see, he, he says he'll come before that day. Well, there's different than perspectives of that day, but it also helps you understand the perspective of the prophet, which is this. Yes, there is a significant that day to the coming of Christ and to his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. But as far as full and final victory, he's speaking of the second advent when Christ will return, which has yet to come. But when you see in one phrase, basically, that the, this Elijah, John the Baptist, will come before that great day of the Lord, before the second coming, you see an idea here of the perspective. It will help you read the prophets. I mean, he sees it as this, uh, he sees the bookends. He sees this incredible, there, there's so much that happens, right, between when John the Baptist comes on the scene and when Christ comes a second time. There's a lot that essentially has to happen for God's people to become God's people in the process. But you get an idea of what he is saying. This is all about God. This is all about God keeping his promises. And this is what you have to look forward to, and you can trust him. Now, when he starts out in verse 1 and he speaks of how judgment is coming, we've talked about this before many times. It is an encouragement to know that God will bring justice. Because too often when we see, for instance, think about their context. They'd gone back to Jerusalem. They were reestablishing practices of the law. They were reestablishing their, their civil practices. And yet they weren't flourishing like they thought they might. And so in this, it still looks like the surrounding nations, which are evil or pagan, are thriving. It looks like God is either for them or he is turning a blind eye, deaf ear to what's really going on. But Malachi reminds them, look, God is going to show justice. He will save some, but he will absolutely judge his enemies. He will judge those who come against him. Everything that we read apocalyptically in Zechariah 14 is what he's referring to here. There will be utter destruction. There will be damnation for those who do not trust in Christ and Christ alone. And that's not because Christ is mean. It's because he's just. This is why we have to remember that we are not those who naturally come to Christ. None of us are. None is righteous. No, not one. And yet, as we see even in this text, righteousness itself is what will save us. And we have none. 
So it's only the righteousness of the one who's yet to come that could possibly save any. And that is an important factor for us to remember as Christians that we were saved by grace through faith. We were not saved because of any righteous, meritorious work of our own. It was only the work of God. He will judge his enemies. He will punish them. But guys, please understand something. He is not merely speaking of some time of tribulation here. He is speaking of a full and final judgment, a full and final completion of his conquering of all that is evil and wicked. So yes, when we seek to be urgent in our evangelism, knowing that there are some, even in our families, uh, perhaps that are, that are uh, seem hell-bent, it seems like they are just destined for some kind of uh, torture and torment for eternity and, and we're burdened by these things. Please remember that, yes, it is a rescue from that, but it's also deliverance to the beauty of who he is and who he's become, the son of righteousness. He says this is some place that will burn like an oven. We see descriptions of this in different places in Scripture, just a couple of those. First of all, over in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, you don't have to turn there, but beginning in verse 7, it says this, and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might when he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed because our testimony to you was believed. To this end, we always pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's really not about garnering fear and that being our motivating factor because even though fear is a factor, in fact, that's much how parenting works. Initially, you curb behavior through negative kind of thing and sometimes through positive reinforcement, but mostly you're curbing their initial behavior through some kind of negative uh, response or reaction to disobedience. Well, in that, basically, we initially start out as little kids of not doing bad things because we fear the bad thing that might happen to us. And Scripture actually says fear is not to be, it's, in fact, it's the beginning of wisdom. It's to understand that these are true realities. But it should give way eventually to love. That is the purest motivation, where we actually want to do the right thing because we love the person that we are serving or that we are obeying in this, namely the Lord. The fact, though, is, is that there is a day that's coming. It is coming. It will come. And on that day, there will be no other hope for men. None. We must see this as an urgency, knowing that things, in fact, Peter even says this in 2 Peter 3, knowing that things will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought we to be in holiness and blamelessness before the Lord? But this, that we would be urgent in our evangelism. It should spur us on to this thinking. And it will be all-consuming. There will be no bunkers uh, spiritually or in reality to hide from when he physically and really comes to establish his reign, to judge the wicked. But we also know that he will purify his own. He says, but for you, in verse 2, who fear my name, the son of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall. I mean, there's this, this simultaneous response of great terror and great joy and elation. When he comes to destroy and judge, he also comes in deliverance, in safety and security for those who believe. So who are those that are his? Well, he says they are those who fear him, who worship him. That's why understanding the heart of worship is so incredibly important to help identify whether or not you are truly the Lord's, but also to help guard your walk with him if you are the Lord's so that you are doing what you should be doing in the meantime until he comes. He goes on to say that it's those who recognize that righteousness is their healing. And that righteousness is what we call an alien righteousness. It's outside of us. 
It's not something that we can muster. It's not some dormant gene spiritually that genetically lives inside of us. No, it has to come in from the outside. Now, there's different interpretations of the son of righteousness here. It's not S-O-N, even though we know Christ has been referred to as the son of righteousness. And most of the early church fathers um, on, on up through even Luther really associated this text to Christ specifically. Absolutely could be the case. It also could be the case of simply it being the descriptor of what righteousness, which does only come through Christ. So it's at least a reference either directly or indirectly to Christ. But let's just suppose that it's modifying simply righteousness. And I think this is the emphasis, the focus here by Malachi. That this expanse, this illumination, that this, uh, the extent to which righteousness is put on display, that it brings healing, is complete and total. That it is life-giving. Everything that you would imagine about sun and its illumination and its effects, its warmth, its healing powers, its dispelling of gloom and darkness, all of these things are brought. In fact, that would very much resonate with when the Lord returns. Because for some, that sun will appear to be heat and torment. But for others, it will be illumination and it will be joy. If anything, it just shows you there is no middle ground. There will be healing as a result of this righteousness. He brings healing. Now, it's not just physical healing, although it could include that. Mainly, it's a healing of the breach, the brokenness that's between man and his God. Righteousness is the only way, and Christ is our righteousness on our behalf. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, here's what it says. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. To those who have obtained, I told you this when we walked through Second Peter, that obtained is to achieve by lots. So it doesn't mean you've worked for it. It means that it was achieved on your behalf by another. But the key there is that for Peter and apostles saying to just the common man, we're all on equal footing before the Lord. But how is that? It's strictly based on the righteousness of Christ. It is not based on any other thing any other heritage or history. The fact is, all of us are unrighteous before him. And then once he has saved us, he makes us completely and totally righteous before himself. There's no hierarchy of those who are a little bit more righteous or those who are just barely righteous. The fact is, yes, in a sense, I think you could say there's a hierarchy of faith. And what I mean by that is some have very little, some have much. But the fact is, we all have faith, even if it's little, in an immovable, unchangeable object. Christ. Christ being our righteousness means that any right that we have, and we will have all the rights of co-heirs with him in the heavenlies, are given us and granted us by Christ himself because we are his, because we've been made his. That's the healing. We've gone from being strangers, aliens, those in exile, to being friends of God. Even in the present difficulties, If you lack joy in all that you're going through right now, whether individually or even corporately, the sadness of losing a pastor, maybe some of you are joyful that you're losing this pastor, but whatever the case is, the the fact that there is change or difficulty in your home situation, if you are lacking joy, and this doesn't mean a giddy happiness, and you don't actually have to bust out of the stall and and jump around like a calf, be kind of weird. That's uh, hopefully there's never been a religious group that said, that's what we should do. Like snake handling, let's do calf jumping. Um, That's hopefully not ever been a thing. But I do encourage you, if you lack joy, to revisit righteousness. You know, a lot of times we'll get to our, we'll, we'll go to our, um, uh, we'll, we'll look back in the concordance or whatever we have at the back of our Bibles and we'll look up words for joy and we'll try to find, well, what's, you know, I need, I'm, I'm just not happy. I'm not doing well. So I need to find verses on joy to make me more joyful. But really what you need is to be able to understand what scripture says that leads to that. 
righteousness and understanding of righteousness. This is not that different than when Peter says in 2 Peter 1, 9, that if you're lacking these positive qualities of following the Lord, and there's seven of them before that, he says, it's because you have forgotten what it means to be cleansed of former sins. He basically says, we sin and we lack joy because we have forgotten what it means to be forgiven. And in this sense, I would say it's because we have forgotten what it means to be righteous, to be made righteous. Even Malachi points to this being alien. It is something that is done to and for us. So as he puts his justice on on display, he does conquer his enemies by his power and for his own renown so that everyone knows that he is mighty, he is God. Malachi then moves on to this idea and this first word in verse 4, remember. Remember is an interesting word because I think that it's also a spiritual discipline. We have so many reminders. So for instance, corporately, when we, you can even see it on the front of the table, do this in remembrance of me. Okay, corporately, there's a discipline in remembering what once was, and we're stating in that remembrance that what once was still is. What he did once was done for always in the sacrificing of himself and being raised from the dead. When we remember what the Lord has done, we're remembering his unchangeable nature. It's not going back and remembering what he was only to come back to the present and believe that he's something else. Basically, for them, the law was still good. The law was still in play. He says, remember the law of my servant Moses. I mean, this was just lifetimes and lifetimes and lifetimes ago. The statutes and rules that I commanded him at Horeb for all of Israel. And remember, this comes at the heels of that exodus which is likened to the Lord's deliverance again and again, especially here in the minor prophets and, and those three nations that have conquered them, but also leading into the coming of Christ. Because that prophet like Moses would eventually come and he would lead them. In fact, not only would he lead them, he would take what was done at Horeb, accomplish it all perfectly. As he interpreted it according to the Sermon on the Mount, that it's not just what you do outwardly, it's also what you do inwardly that defines whether or not you've broken the law. And Christ perfectly keeps the law at Mount Horeb in his lifetime. And in earning that righteousness, so to speak, on our behalf, for those who believe that, then when he died his death, he took on himself the death, the penalty of what life is for, what the future is for those who live unrighteous lives. But then when he rose from the dead, that means he sealed the deal forever. That the law of God has now been fulfilled in the grace and the work of Christ. So in the meantime, knowing that Christ will come, knowing that this day of the Lord, when the Lord comes, he will judge his enemies, he will deliver the saints, that in the midst of all this, what are we supposed to do? He says, basically, in the meantime, remember the law. Now, again, it's qualified for us because we are not on this side. We're, not on, the, we're on the right side of the New Testament page, so to speak, in your Bibles there, uh, not on, still on the left. We are informed by the coming of Christ. But I still believe that Malachi looks forward to and sees that coming as we see in this text. He says, behold, verse 5, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. We know that what he's referring to is that there is one coming who's a messenger, and this messenger will be John the Baptist. If you look in uh, in Matthew chapter 11, for instance, In Matthew chapter 11, 11 through 15, he says, Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one, uh, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. He who hears that, let him hear. So the idea here is, of course, uh, it does have to be mentioned that in John chapter 1, 21 and 25, John the Baptist actually denies being Elijah. So how does all that mesh? 
Well, simply what he's referring to about Elijah is that he's not saying that he's actually the embodiment of Elijah himself that he does represent. But we also understand that what the Jews understood Elijah to be, they had also put some assumptions and associations onto Elijah the prophet himself that were not given by Scripture. So basically their expectation of what this Elijah person would be, John did deny that he would be the kind of Elijah they were looking for. But Christ himself makes clear that John the Baptist is indeed this representative Elijah who is coming, heralding the coming day of God. This is the fulfillment of Malachi chapter 4. John the Baptist comes over in Luke chapter 1. Starting in verse 14. It says, and you will have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth for he will be great before the Lord and he must not drink wine or strong drink and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. God is sending messengers. Ultimately, the righteousness that will come to bear on all of his is, it is Christ, but it comes through Christ. The heralding of that righteousness that will come through the Christ and bring healing to all of God's people is John the Baptist. And when he comes, he will bring about this message of restoration and repentance leading to identity with God. This message that there is redemption, there is restoration, but it's found through repentance, demands that we look forward to his coming. So here's what it means, basically. The Lord is going to come. He is going to bring judgment, and he is going to deliver his people. In the meantime, while we wait for that, we need to listen to the word of God. We don't keep the law in the same sense, but we do understand that the law exposes that we can't keep, we aren't righteous people. Christ alone is our righteousness. So hopefully for those of you who are not Christian, you realize that your sin exposes your need for someone else to save you, that you can't do it. Christ is the only one that can. For you who are Christians, understand that you are given the power of the presence of the Holy Spirit to keep what God has said. We are to basically take the word of the Lord and do what the word of the Lord says. That never changes. Whether you have a, a, an actual senior pastor or not, it's always an under-shepherd position. The chief shepherd never forsakes his people. Christ. So we are to study the word, we're to pray the word, we're to apply it, and we're to put it on display regularly through baptism and through communion. The word of God is what we follow in the meantime. And that's what the children of Israel had forgotten time and time and time again. When they got weary, they stopped living by faith, they started living by sight. And as soon as you do that, there is a grand division between living the word of God and trying to live by sight. You will take it and twist it and make it into something else. People do this today. It doesn't matter what your political ideology is. Anytime someone tries to make heaven on earth and they have some kind of saturation in religious life, they will take the Bible and use it as, and weaponize it basically, as a means for them to accomplish whatever they want to see happen. But the Spirit of God says the Word of God gives birth to faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of the Lord. People who are living by the word of the Lord are people who endure faithfully and await the coming of the one we don't see. They don't use it to try to accomplish a kingdom that men can see and therefore someone's going to rise to power and get all the credit and it ain't going to be Jesus. In the meantime, while we wait, even if things are hard, we are called to live according to the word by faith. Keep doing the same steady things. And that's one of the joys of gathering as the people of God. The word of God gets preached and we're reminded to live by faith, not by sight. We're reminded to endure and to patiently uh, endure difficult things, even persecution. And not always cry foul. Just simply, we are, I mean, we are going to, as, as we remain in a lost world, we are going to face times of trial and persecution. We are called to be faithful not, a, not cry injustice as if it's a surprise that the lost world would treat the saved person with harm. Christ himself even said it would happen in John 17. 
We are to live then according to the word like this world is not our home. They are waiting for the kingdom of God to come. There's going to be a messenger still in the future. He's going to declare this righteousness that's going to be coming through the righteous one who we know to be Christ. And there will eventually be this complete and final both destruction and deliverance. We are to live as if the kingdom is not here yet. And those two things I think should apply to the church no matter what time of life we're in, no matter what context. But I think it especially applies when your your pastor's preaching his last sermon as your pastor and you're then selecting a search team and then we are going on to other things. The thing is, is that you are to remain steadfast in the Word of God. Study it, pray it, apply it, and put it on display. And you're also to help guard one another to make sure the kingdom of God is something you look forward to, not something you're trying to make happen. Live like this world is not your home. Oh, you might grow weary, but again, think about why are you doing what you do? Is it for the glory of God? Is it for the glory of men? If it's for the glory of God, we will keep doing what Scripture simply says to keep doing. Even if we don't see physically the payoff. Because we know that the Word of God has said, thus says the Lord. And that's always good and glorifying to Him. But as soon as we take it and try to make it something else, we want to then take precedence and get the credit for either being right or being in charge. With not growing weary, we will then be reminded in Scripture to worship rightly. We will be reminded that we are to have a view of God that is accurate and sovereign. We're to have a view of His love that is about grace and mercy and not about any entitlement whatsoever. We're to promote the eternal kingdom, not come to our side, come to our branding, come to whatever. We're to invite people of the kingdom that's to come. To remind each other that when the kingdom comes, there will be no more suffering for the believer. Oh, but we are still breathing. And so while we are and should be great worshipers even in this world, we also simultaneously must be great evangelists at sharing his goodness. The more you remind yourself of the greatness of God according to the word of God, I promise you that your fervor in evangelism will increase. Promote the eternal kingdom of God. So on a personal or private level, here's what I would charge you to do. Read the Bible daily. Not unlike when I've charged uh, my kids when they've gone on to something else. Is trust the common means of grace. Which are things like reading the word, prayer. Corporately, it would be gathering with the saints regularly to worship and be exposed to that word and be reminded that we are a little representation of a kingdom yet to come. Read the Bible For those of you who are leaders in your home, be renewed in leading the home. Even if you're an empty nester, get the word of God, get on your knees and pray with your spouse. Read a psalm, do something to get the word of God front and center in the home. You don't have to be a great exegetical teacher, just simply read and pray. If you want to sing or something like that, that's fine, but just do something simple to get the word of God out front. So read the Bible, lead with the Bible in your homes. Pray for the world. There are huge, massive things going on around the entire globe. It's a reminder that, first of all, if God ever did take his hand off, the chaos would be exponentially greater. And he does keep it under reign. But at the same time, it's also a reminder of the deep, intense brokenness and literally Whatever you see on the news, even if you were to turn the sound all the way down and not listen to any of the commentary and just watch the videos, you would be reminded of this. God is going to make all of that right. All of that right. But I want to caution you on who you hope gets God's justice. Even when you see your enemies on a screen, pray that there would be a revival amongst that group. Pray that there would be deliverance and salvation because we all were enemies at one point. Pray for the world and then wait on the Lord. Look, there's no secret. I think the way that we remind each other, we grasp this 
Spiritual discipline of reminder is simply with the word of God being preached, being taught. Guys, this is why so often we've had over the last two and a half years, uh, over and over again in our Sunday school classes, we've had people come to us or come to the elders or teachers and say, wow, that was just so right on with what we were talking about, whether it's from the sermon to the text or from, uh, to the Sunday school or vice versa. Look, it's just simply when you walk through the Word of God and have decided that all of the Word of God, the Old and the New Testament, is good for you and good for the people of God, you will be reminding each other regularly that He is here, He is not silent, and He will cause you to endure. I love what Rich prayed earlier. This is not about just keeping things together or whatever. Again, the chief shepherd has never left. By God's grace, this is not a broken departure. By God's grace, there's not something going on otherwise. This is a, a, a out of the blue um, kind of calling both on our lives, but it does have ripple effects to everyone. Corporately, but down to my daughter, down to others who have to make decisions, down to the Lewises who took my cat. <laughs> it was my... It was my girl's cat, <laughs> make no mistake. Um, there's a reason I'm traveling with two dogs today. Um, but guys, whatever the case is, no matter how messed up circumstances are, your hopes and your, even your fears cannot rise and fall on varied circumstances. Because the word remember says he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The word remember the word of God, remember the word of the Lord is a reminder that we, our faith and our fearlessness is circumstanceless. It doesn't mean ignore the circumstances. It just means there are no circumstances that should be able to cause the spiritual ground under the feet of the righteous to shake. He is our firm foundation. Remember the word of the Lord. Stay steady, look forward to his coming, and help each other fight to look forward to a kingdom, not become enamored with one that sounds like is being established on earth that might be of God. He is coming with his own kingdom. He is coming with his own justice and his own deliverance. Look to him. Be faithful in the meantime. Don't get too riled up about the things of this world, and, but do get riled up about each other, seeking how to outlove each other how to make sure you encourage each other to endure well in this world. May that be God's course for you. May it be steady. I pray it's even kind of boring, but I pray that in the midst of it, you will see at the end incredible fruit and maturity come through the word of God to this people and expand to an evangelism like this church has never known in her past to reach the lost that are here in Pike County. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your faithfulness, that worship is centered on declaring that you, God, are the faithful one. You are our righteousness. You are the one who has given us mercy as opposed to justice, but that you will one day enact justice so that all your enemies, all those who do not truly follow you, and perhaps even many that we think absolutely must be following you because of things that they say. And yet, God, there is a strong depart from me, I never knew you kind of expression that will come in on that day. It will not just be the obvious enemy that will not participate in your kingdom. God, I pray that you would help us to simply, by faith, not by sight, but by faith, know that you are the greater reality than anything that we hear about politically anything we see culturally or socially, we know that ultimately you, your righteousness, that you will illuminate your kingdom. There will be no more sun or moon. There will be no need because Jesus, you will be our all in all. And so we look and long for that day. And I just pray for all of us in the meantime, but also I mean, for us personally, as as we start something new, there can be a, a fake uh, kind of uh, renewal that comes with just new location or, or whatever, or being in the situation we're going into, protect my family um, and even protect uh, Temple Baptist from uh, thinking that, you know, a new day or a new change just automatically brings things. 
or even here, God, with the, the newness and the changes and, uh, and also how so many will step up. I pray, Lord, that you would bring such great blessing that both churches at some point could give testimony to there is such a beauty and a goodness to staying the course, to remembering the word of God, to read it, to lead in it in our homes, to apply it, to put it on display in our ordinances. And God, as we do so, we trust that you will keep our hope alive, looking forward to your coming. And while we follow you, you will stoke our hearts to share your good news of the gospel to the lost world. Oh God, may this simple course be ours. May it be something that we defend, fight for, pray for. And God, at the same time, help us not to be short on even rebuking others, maybe even in our own camp, from losing hope in living by faith and starting to live by sight. And Lord, let there be a caution in us all. Oh God, glorify yourself even here and in the homes that are represented here. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.